So tell us a little about your background. I got my doctorate in rhetoric from UC Berkeley. I, in fact, have never taken a philosophy class in my life. I did undergraduate work at UPenn in history and wrote about historiography for my thesis, wrote about Foucault. I went haywire at some point during my very bored undergraduate years when I read Derrida and Foucault and Kierkegaard and Gadamer. But then I ended up writing a dissertation on trope theory using Merleau-Ponty and Deleuze. So I ended up actually studying rhetoric. So in many ways, it's funny to be on a philosophy podcast. I call myself a sophist, you know. I'm very excited to have, <laughs> I'll just say, one of the others. Here. So we, we did Lacan without a guest. And there's this whole branch of philosophy that we've been looking at a little bit with the Lacan episodes and the Derrida. And I'm not sure if Deleuze qualifies in there. I did not hear the name Deleuze said even once in my entire time in graduate school from 1994 to 2000 at the University of Texas. Right. That could just be that he's on the ascendancy now. He was recommended to us by enough listeners. There were some activity around him. In fact, there have been three, more than for any other figure, three not school groups. That is the groups that go with our member only site. So listeners get together and read stuff, but he's not somebody that I'd heard of before. And so it's always been a little fascinating why these sociological barriers are there. Yeah. You know, it's not like philosophy, the department I was in was an edifice. It was, it's not like it, there was any consensus at all among the people there, but yet in all of my experience with all those different people, none of them... <laughs> Had us read Deleuze or Lacan. Even, you know, UC Berkeley rhetoric is presumably like the hotbed of all this stuff. I started writing about Deleuze and everyone thought I was fucking nuts. They weren't into Deleuze and that all changed. But I was really sort of outcast. I mean, I was outcast for a lot of reasons, but that was definitely one of them. I think everyone thought he was just sort of a fucking nut. Not unjustifiably. And I'll say even I was really into Deleuze and I thought Guattari was sort of a nut. And I was like, you know, I'm into Deleuze, he's a little more rigorous. But since then, I've totally changed and I'm crazy about Guattari. The more untethered I've become from the academy, the more I've embraced the sort of schizo-psychedelic worldview of these guys. Well, I think that's the only time so far that the pair had come up in this podcast was on our Foucault episode, where okay. our guest, who is a grad student studying Foucault, she made some comment about the two of these guys just smoking weed together and coming up with a lot of <laughs> crazy ass shit. Yes. Uh, the book that we read this time, What is Philosophy? I didn't see that so much. This is their last of their three. Their first was in 1972. The second was in 1980. And this was 1991. They also have that small book on Kafka somewhere in there. Ah, and this is uh, pretty close before Guattari died, right? Yes. He was a Lacanian psychoanalyst and political radical. And so... Deleuze wrote many more things than these three or four collaborative efforts, among them a lot of apparently very perceptive and clear secondary literature about Spinoza, about Hume was the first big thing that he wrote about, which was very... He got his dissertation, I think. I yes, know. which was apparently not the cool thing to do in France <laughs> when he was doing it. And one of his whole his books, I believe it's called Logic and Sense, takes as the starting point, Frege and Russell on the Fregean sense. The guy was very widely read and should not be thought of from what I read in like the Stanford encyclopedia as some sort of, like, he doesn't seem to talk about Derrida, for instance, at all that I saw in any of the stuff that I've seen by him. He really saw himself as an old style metaphysician of some sort, just building off of Nietzsche and Kant and Hume and all the greats. Well, there's no question you'll have a lot of people squirming in their seats as you say that. Because, you know, his whole relationship to the history of philosophy is interesting. I'm not disagreeing or agree. I don't. Uh, you know much more than I do. That's why you're here. So correct me. What he argues is that there's another history of philosophy. So if you look at Derrida, you know, Derrida was always sort of trying to undo the history of philosophy and always show its sort of failure and a double movement. But Deleuze was this positivist. He really said, what if we don't begin with the failure of metaphysics, but then try to find those kind of moments that are decentered, that are multiple, right? I mean, he's really a philosopher of multiplicity, if nothing else. And he found this alternate history that he would sort of track. He talks about all these people, you know, Don Scottis, you know, Bergson plays this huge role in Leibniz. And then he does take some from Kant. But he also talks about, when he's writing about Kant, that it's not a question of having a camp. And I think that's what comes really clear through what is philosophy. It was so great having this opportunity to reread it really closely. And I was sitting down taking notes. I felt like I was in grad school again. And it was just kind of fun. Now you know what I feel like every two weeks. 
<laughs> yeah, talk to you. It's kind of intense, like uh, being back in this world with these guys. He's not interested in, again, setting up this camp. He never says, you know, the end of metaphysics at one point. He says, you know, it's a boring question. Like, who even asked that? And, you know, that was the Derridian thing and all the terrible Derridian Gestapo that flooded the academy in the 90s, just trying to constantly enforce anyone was essentialist. They attacked you. And for Deleuze, it was such an idiotic approach. He was, again, more positivist. And he found this, again, this alternate history streaming through wherever he could sort of find it. And he'll take pieces of anything that turns him on. Well, just as an example of that, what's use the writings of an actual schizophrenic as one of the jumping off points for uh, the first book that Deleuze and Guattari did together. Uh-huh. Guattari. Sorry. I will pronounce. We got somebody, somebody <laughs> emailed us to say, I like your show, but you really should look up the French pronunciations of things. <laughs> you know, though, I got to say, I think people should pronounce it any way they want. I, I'm with you, I man. Think, yeah, who cares? <laughs> Certainly, Guattari does not care. No, he does not. And you know, my son's first name is Felix. Not, and everyone thinks that's why, but I did not name my kid after Guattari. That's insane. If you named your kid Gilles, then <laughs> yes. that would be more obvious. <laughs> Yeah, I, don't know. I mean, I just, I like that notion that he's, again, not part of a camp and not part of that postmodern positioning against the greats or for the greats or anything like that. Like, it's just, here's my world. It's this proliferation of worldviews, right? All these planes of imminence, all these different problems and different concepts. Well, that's what he might say, but just his writing style itself <laughs> puts him sociologically, as far as the American Academy is concerned, in a particular camp. Mm. In other words, it's very hard to read. (laughs) It is really hard to read. After reading What is Philosophy, I did want to read some of his explications of maybe Spinoza or something like that, because he really is very astute in condensing, in interesting ways, the history of philosophy in between things that are very difficult to understand about what he's saying. The articulation of the various personae in philosophy, I thought he was pretty good on that. Oh my God, yeah. He's very generous. He doesn't have that kind of snarky thing that we want to associate with what people want to call the postmodern. He wants things to be great. He wants them to be interesting. He doesn't want to reduce them. You can kind of see him saying, can't we all just get along, man? (laughs) Yeah, kind of. But he also is into, again, I love this, these images of the multiplicity that may or may not get along. That may have conflict, but more, have more interesting sort of spatial relationships than either being parallel or in conflict or in unity. And it's that other space that's always sort of attracted me, this other sort of logic. Probably the most famous concept out of Deleuze and Guattari is the rhizome. It's the figure that has multiple roots, multiple points of growth. That's what he's always imagining, right? And imagining philosophy that way. There's all these ways in. And sometimes you'll crisscross somebody else. And, you know, you're reading Descartes and you're into Descartes. And then you can weave down and find this weird moment of Dostoevsky, which is a great example in what is philosophy. You know, is Descartes going mad in Russia with this version of the idiot who's doubting everything and then resurfaces in this totally new guise in Russian existential literature. And it's a beautiful moment to me. That's so respectful of everybody. Yeah, it's worth noting too that his program is generally speaking positive and constructive, even though stylistically he dons the clothes of the postmodernists. He's not embarking on a campaign of deconstruction. He's not trying to dislocate the self. He's not articulating some unstructured parallel discourse of the other in the unconscious. And his favorite philosopher is Spinoza. In a weird way, Spinoza, I guess, is extremely radical and not radical at all. I get where you're coming from, Dylan and Daniel, when you talk about him being positive and constructive. He's also not full of anxiety and um, (laughs) self-abdignating nihilism. He doesn't have that disease that Nietzsche in particular has, and even Heidegger of Sartre and existentialism of just kind of wringing your hands about the bigness of the world or staring into the abyss. It's none of that. Despite the difficulty of the writing, and I admit that it is quite difficult, I have to say, of the stuff that we've done recently, of the French stuff we've done, I enjoyed this the most by far. I found myself captivated, if confused often, and a little bit irritated here and there. I thought it was much more provocative in trying to articulate this middle space about an answer to one of the oldest questions in philosophy about being wrong and not being wrong and how we talk about the world in a way that admits of multiplicity without having it be merely relative. He's going after big game 
Yes. Well, this book, just from what I experienced of the previous 1000 Plateaus, this is a much more calm, sober (laughs) sort of project that (laughs) the 1000 Plateaus introduction specifically has a, you can read these chapters in any order. They're like tracks on a record. And if you don't like it, just move on to the next one. And the way it read was just, they figured some concept and they just went on about it like jazz musicians. Like, how can we just unweave this concept And I got a little of that in here, like, okay, we have a chapter on the plane of imminence. So it's not entirely a systematic presentation. And it seems like it could have been presented in five pages instead of 15 or 20, whatever it is. So there's a little bit of still that feeling. But overall, you still get the feeling that this book is a systematic whole. This is a creation which people say that about the previous books as well. So I'm misrepresenting a bit, but... No, no, you're 100% right. I mean, Thousand Plateaus, is, there's a lot of stuff in there. They mess up. It's inco- absolutely gobbledygook sometimes, and they don't care. And you're, you're supposed to kind of jump around all over the place. So this is no doubt more formal, more rigorous, more... They have a system. You see, they have science, they have the arts, they have philosophy, different kinds of concepts. They... We're mapping through what's the role of the concept, what's the role of affect, what's the role of the persona. There's more form here, right. if you will. No doubt about it. Just to summarize, ostensibly this is a book presenting a framework for thinking about doing philosophy, of how to compare different philosophers, different works by the same philosopher, shifts historically over time. He wants to characterize what makes philosophy different than science, what makes it different from art. And in the three chapters we hit, it's actually a pretty small number of central concepts, which are the three chapters, right? That he thinks that what philosophy essentially is, is the creation of concepts. But he has a very strange notion of concept. It's not just you're looking at a bunch of chairs and you figure out what they have in common, and that's the concept chair. Philosophical concepts in particular, he has a pretty complicated explanation for. So that's the first thing. The second chapter is the plane of imminence, which has to do with when you create a philosophy, you're creating concepts, but there's always a background into which these concepts fit. It's pre-philosophical, but he says at the same time, it's created at the same time as the concepts. (laughs) You might think of it as the set of intuitions and questions and things that would make coming up with this concept make sense at all. And there's a lot more complexity to the notion, of course, of the plane of imminence. So then you've got those two things. And then the third chapter is conceptual personae, which are, in many cases, they're equivalent to the names of the philosophers. But he wants to make it clear that he's not saying that the conceptual persona that created the cogito is Descartes himself. He wants to point at some kind of icon that you can figure out just by, you don't have to read a Descartes biography to figure this out. The conceptual persona in that case would be, well, he calls it the idiot, but it's the doubter. It's the one that I'm going to deny all this stuff that's been handed down to me from Aristotle and the scholastics. And I want to just use the light of reason to figure stuff out. So there's a personality that, for one thing, makes the concepts make intuitive sense, a little more so than if you just had a discursive set of sentences of describing the concept. To put a personality with it helps us to understand it. But he also just thinks that it's an essential co-creation with a philosophy. So all three of these things go together. The concepts, the plane of imminence that they're on is the horizon stretches out to infinity in all directions, whatever. But yet it's not a perfect plane. It has folds, it has eddies, it has illusions all around. (laughs) So he has this whole topographic metaphor. And then the personae that populate the plane and give life, give motive force to the concepts. So most of what we need to do here is just explain what those three things are and whether this combined picture that they end up giving us jibes with what we understand philosophy to be. In fact, just a few episodes ago, we set out to record a what is philosophy discussion. Now it actually turned more into why philosophy and turned into more of us telling about why we personally each got into philosophy, which is, I think, a a fairly natural chain that Deleuze would have a lot of sympathy with. That It's very similar to why with concepts you run chasing into conceptual personae and all that kind of stuff very quickly. But as far as a definition of what is philosophy, the only thing I could pull out of our past discussion was, I recall, I characterized it as just general inquiry before it gets specific enough for a specific science or the things left over after a lot of specific sciences take out their bit. And that is exactly not what (laughs) Deleuze thinks it is, that it's a fundamentally different enterprise. I taught the introduction to rhetoric at UC Berkeley for many years, six years, a big lecture. and It was really fun to really introduce people to what rhetoric is, because people certainly didn't have uh, really many associations with it other than sort of empty political language. But I used to say, well, you know, just look at the course catalog for philosophy and look at the course catalog for the rhetoric department. 
And in philosophy, there's always these classes, right? There's a class on mind. Who's teaching mind this semester? Who's the mind guy? There's the language guy. There's the self guy. And of course, there's other courses. But as you guys must know much better than I do, once you're out on the market, right? Those are the fields. I'm a cognitive guy right? I'm the language guy. I'm the natural language guy. There's these clear sort of categories, these clear questions that everyone's trying to answer. In rhetoric department, the classes were completely idiosyncratic. I taught a class called Join Complexity. I taught another class called Bring on the Strange. The classes, they had their own logic, call it imminent logic. They made sense on their own terms. They didn't bubble up. There were all these sort of discrete moments that connected to other things in these funny ways, maybe common texts. Foucault and Nietzsche was really the main figures who linked a lot of different things together, but not always. But yeah, you get this very sort of fundamentally different approach, right? That they come along and say philosophy is not about answering these big questions. We're not all collectively trying to figure out what is mind, what is truth, what is self. For them, the philosopher is the person who poses a problem that they see that's bizarre and wrapped up in their whatever pre-conceptual, pre-analytic world, and then creates concepts, right? So it becomes this thing that hangs together, but unto itself in this sort of sui generis way. When I read that, I was like, okay, this is rhetoric. This is how I'm imagining rhetoric in a way, not philosophy. So it's interesting to have them be calling that philosophy. Well, he does say late in our reading, he quoted Bergson to the effect that a well-posed problem is a problem solved. Mm. And a way of saying that is, as soon as you come up with these questions, you've already done a lot of the difficult philosophical work just to phrase the question itself. Yes. And in Deleuze's picture, a lot of this is done sort of under the table and rather irrationally. <laughs> you know, so why do you think a question, and ultimately the way that he's going to judge different philosophies is not about whether they're true, because truth itself is a philosophical concept. It's sort of raised within a given philosophy. The whole picture of what is going to count as a true response to something is part of the philosophy itself, I think. Yeah. So it turns out of what is interesting, <laughs> if something is interesting or enlightening, and this really goes very well with, I think, the way we have ended up judging philosophies insofar as we judge them at all in these podcasts is, yeah, I see where he was coming from, but I didn't really see the point. That mm. was a fairly common one. I understood what was being said. I don't know why this would be interesting or important to anybody. In disputes between different philosophers, you don't have so much, though of course it happens, direct disagreements about facts. I mean, facts are something you can usually investigate <laughs> and gain some agreement on, but it's a matter of, well, fine, I'll grant that, but that's not central. That's not important. So what determines what is important in the first place, what questions are worth asking, the conceptual priority, what words you use to ask the question, a lot of that comes out of this, what he's going to call the plane of imminence, right? Which is part and parcel of creating the philosophy. Since reading this, well, I first read this book, and then I, I read a lot of Bergson. Bergson talks about asking the right question. He says, you know, all these philosophers, they begin from the wrong place. They begin by saying the mind is of a different stuff than the world. And then you inaugurate all these very convoluted epistemological problems, right? How can I know something if I'm mind and it's there? And he's like, but if we just begin with a different question and say it's all stuff, then all your questions, all your thousands of pages, your centuries of solutions all become irrelevant, right? We just began from a different place. I say mind is not different than the desk. It's all just stuff going with stuff. Well, it's not that it's not different. The difference is not of central philosophical importance. Deleuze is coming with Bergson and Heidegger, and there are, there are a lot of folks that were criticizing metaphysics itself, the project of doing metaphysics. What is it that you actually think you're doing? And I think that's one of the things. If you start with something like a substance metaphysics, and then you think about these observed differences, obvious, undeniable differences between the desk in front of me and a memory I have, that you can't say those are all the same thing. Ah. Of course, they're different. Right. But the question is, is that of central ontological importance? Right. And you have to have a notion of ontology <laughs> to ask that question. You have to have this traditional picture of metaphysics, of substances, of this presence metaphysics that Derrida criticized it as, to then give rise to the difficulties of the mind-body problem, say, in the way that you were alluding to. Right. What I'm trying to respond to Deleuze here is, yes, you could say a lot of the work, as a matter of fact – 
is done under the table, right? This is Nietzsche's big complaint. This is a, an ongoing theme in his work that if he's criticizing ethical philosophers, say we've mentioned, you know, he would criticize the British ethical philosophers, utilitarians and stuff is really just being boring, drab, <laughs> computational people and say, that's why they think utilitarianism is a good idea. Or that's why somebody would believe in God or any number of things. You can claim that as a psychological theory, but that's different from saying there is no argument against such things except to dismiss their psychology as warped. Certainly, you would not want to do that uniformly across all types of concepts, types of areas of knowledge. You might think about values in particular with the sharp is ought distinction. You could say, we could agree about all the different is's that there are, but still have different values. And the only way that I can ultimately critique you on your values is by saying you are a nutcase or you do not have proper empathy for the people around you. I have to argue on that sort of basis. And so there's a certain stopping point that especially admits of the Nietzschean kind of critique, which I'm reading here into Deleuze. But it wasn't entirely clear to me whether Deleuze is actually committed to saying that because a lot of the setting up of a philosophy is laying down a plane of eminence, is laying down a set of unarticulated, it's not a matter of there are 10 assumptions here that I haven't unearthed. And the proper part of doing a philosophy is to actually write down all 10 of them or something. Obviously, that's a pretty ignorant way to think of what the pre-philosophical intuitions are. But there's still a sense, back to Socrates, that it is the job of philosophy to unearth the pre-philosophical to evaluate it, that that's what the examined life is all about. And it seems like in the thing that you say is similar to rhetoric that Deleuze is doing is admitting that this is impossible and is a wrongheaded approach in the first place, because any philosophy can only sort of be judged by its own light. It's all imminent to itself. You can't judge a set of priest philosophical opinions by unearthing them one by one and subjecting them to evaluation because you're always going to be evaluating it from a plane of imminence that is irrelevant to the one that is different from the one that you're yeah. evaluating. He seems to think of philosophers talk past each other yes. all the yeah. time. Yeah. He even says dialogue itself is useless. Discussion is, is, a, discussion discussion is, useless. is useless, right? Yeah. It just distracts because this creation of concepts, this figuring out the internal logic of your system is a very solitary activity. And if you get another person into it to ask you questions, they're coming from a different place and it's just, it's not going to be helpful to you. He says, we think we see in Socrates, in Plato, a model of discussion, but really it's Socrates made discussion impossible <laughs> because oh, yeah. he just oh, Jesus. He shuts everybody down. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> It's a funny thing for someone who did this work collaboratively to say. <laughs> yes, yes. No, but, but come on. Can I just... Mark did a nice job, I think, of in a very condensed way, in a couple sentences, summarizing. But I think it would be worthwhile to go through those chapters a little bit more and talk through what is a concept and what is a plane of imminence and articulate those parts that, you know, Mark rightly glossed over in order to make this question much more interesting and accessible. Because right now, yes. I think as it is, it's basically unaccessible to anybody who hasn't read this book already. I think yeah. that the question yeah. that Mark yeah. is presenting gets at the heart of what is a difficulty with Deleuze and a way in which he stands at odds with the philosophical tradition. He's making a move to try to avoid some of the old classic conflicts in philosophy that a deconstructionist might try to, his approach might go head on, and he's trying to avoid that. And evaluating that's going to require us to understand a little bit about what he's doing. Yeah, no question. All right. <laughs> let's start with chapter one then. Do you guys read the introduction? Yes. The notion of the friend I thought was sure. really kind of beautiful. What is the philosopher's relationship to the concept? And he begins talking about the philosopher as a friend. And he says, you know, the philosopher is a kind of friend of the concept the way the wood joiner is a friend of the wood. And what's nice too is he doesn't just say that that is the relationship of a philosopher to the concept, but he begins to posit that and try to feel that out a little bit and then wonders what other kinds of friends, who else can claim these relationships? Who else claims to be the friend of the concept? And it's really a question of the posturing and how you stand towards this practice and towards concepts. Right from this introduction, the very notion that he's suggesting that there are postures He's already situating us in a certain vision of philosophy, right? In a certain mode of operation or of practice and of critique. So that rather than coming out and saying, you know, philosophy is thinking about big questions, he says, 
who's the friend of the concept? It was a little off-putting. I mean, you know, I, I had to read it many, many times when I first read it. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? He's not coming with this out of nowhere. He's pointing to the Greeks, right? That that's, they call it, the philosopher is the friend of wisdom, those who seek right. wisdom, but do not formally possess it. They're exactly. not sages. He makes that distinction a few times. That's not handing down received wisdom. Exactly. I, I like that he begins to compare it to, again, the woodworker and to this notion of creation, of doing something. That there's a kind of labor and a kind of work that's not solely, while it is the realm of thought, he says concept is thought happens at the speed of thought, there is still this figure of the manual side of things, the constructivist side of things, that's already beginning to position us as we begin this book in a slightly different vantage point. I find there's something very, I want to say, cute about this introduction. Who is the friend? You just want to be friends. And am I the facilitator? Am I is a friend of facilitator? Am I tearing at it? Am I the master of it? Well, no, that's not really being a good friend. You know, we talked about the positivism, right? The kind of generosity here. How will we stand towards philosophy? How we stand towards our own concepts? How will we stand towards the concepts of others? And he makes it this sort of socio-ethical question, but also a question of comportment and posturing. Where am I and what am I doing? And how do I feel about myself? And already he's just in that simple move, introducing a fundamentally different image of thought, an image of the philosopher. Even before that, at the very beginning of the introduction, it struck me it very much like Heidegger's when he starts his discussion about being that he says, yeah. we don't even know how to ask yeah. the question of being. Of course, reading that, what justification do you think that there's a question there to ask? So the way that they start this book here is the question, what is philosophy, can perhaps be posed only late in life. It is a question posed in a moment of quiet restlessness at midnight when there's no longer anything to ask. That point of non-style when one can finally say, what is it that I've been doing all my life had not yet been reached? Which, that doesn't match my experience, <laughs> that philosophers are so self-reflective that almost as a corollary to doing any particular philosophical work, they're also asking, why am I doing this? What is this for? What is philosophy itself? So for him to say that we don't even ask this question until we're old because we're so pulled into particular philosophical investigations is just like Heidegger to deny that everybody who thinks they know what they're doing is correct in that. Well, there, there's a couple of weird moves that do here, right? Right from that get-go. The first figures they actually introduce are not philosophers, but painters. You're reading a book on philosophy, and all of a sudden he's talking about Titian, Turner, and Monet. And then he's going to end up talking about how these multiple logic, science, art, philosophy all participate and bleed in and out of each other and amplify. And what that